Harris Creek, how we doing? You guys are awesome, man. I need y'all, I want you sitting there every week. I see you, let's go, let's go, so fun. Oh man, well, people think that I am not very athletic. They've said that about me, I know, I know, I know. And, and I've, I've taken the high road, you know, I've let, I've let those rumors circulate around and, and it, you know, here's the truth, I, went to school, kindergarten to eighth grade, uh, I went to a small Catholic school in a small town. And uh, in about fifth, sixth, seventh grade, fifth grade, I was introduced, so track and field, I was introduced to long jump, all right? I've always been tall for my um, age, almost said, I've always been tall for my height. <laughs> I've always been tall for my age. And, uh, and so I, I start doing long jump. I mean, they say, hey, run, you know, there's a board, just jump off that board, see how far you can go, it's a sandbox. And I dominated, all right? I mean, it turns out I am a prodigy at long jump. I'm like this, I found my thing, and I'm thinking like, this is amazing because, you know, I mean, my whole life is now set for the, you know, like colleges are gonna be calling and saying, hey, come here. And, and I'm like, I found my thing, long jump. And so I would go, you know, I went to, you know, we would go to these neighboring track meets of small, you know, uh, Catholic schools, and they would have these small track meets, and I would go and just collect blue ribbons. You know, I was always like a foot taller than everybody else. Like, all right, you know, just first place ribbons. I'm starting a collection. Like, this is amazing. Like, here we go. I've got my thing. And then here, here's the problem with that is in the eighth grade, they said, hey, we're going to give you an option to do athletics at the public school. So what we'll do is we'll take the old church band over to Quero Junior High and, and you can actually compete in the track meets there. And I'm thinking this is going to be incredible because, you know, I've got my blue ribbon collection and so I'm going to go and show them the prodigy that I am at, at long jump. And I go to that first um, practice and I go over to those long jump, jump pits, or, which were a little nicer than what I was used to. And uh, it turns out I'm unbelievably mediocre at long jump. <laughs> like, like, wow, like they're just, you know, these uncoordinated Catholic boys uh, weren't much competition. But when you get out there in the, the real world and many people come from all over, turns out I'm not that good. One minute I'm collecting blue ribbons, the next minute I'm not even qualifying, you know, not even, you know, like you can't even compete. And I'm like, what in the world? And as I, th I start there to make the point that I think as we talk about the subject of abiding, it's like, how am I doing? Well, what do I measure myself up against? Like, what grade would I give myself? Am I getting a 90, a 95, a 62? You know, what's par? It's like, how do we know how we're doing right now in the topic of abiding? And I think often we're comparing ourselves to the wrong subject. We think, well, I'm doing better than them. You know, they call themselves a Christian. I don't do the things that they do. So maybe I'm doing pretty good. Well, what if that's not reality? What if you came into church this morning and, and we could measure, like you could stand before Jesus. Jesus could give you say, hey, this is how you're doing at abiding. And you would know, and then what shifts would we make? And so as we wrap up this series, the series is abide. As we wrap up this series, we're going to be in another chapter that uses this exact same word, abide. First John chapter two. And, and I'm gonna to read to you a verse from there. This is what it says. This is straight from the scripture. It says, this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to abide must. And so John, this is the apostle John, not John the Baptist, the, John, the one that Jesus loved, the one that spent a lot of times with Jesus. He's going to tell us, if you claim to abide, you must and he's gonna give us some things that, that we need to make sure that we're doing so that we know we're abiding. And that's the message today, how to know if we're abiding. I'm gonna give you a lot. We're gonna move through a chunk of scripture fast. This is a note taker sermon. 
And so if you have a pen, something to write on, you're gonna wanna grab that. If you don't, you're welcome to take notes on your phone, but you're gonna wanna stay with me because the slides are gonna be moving fast. They're gonna be changing a little faster than normal. And, and so just to, to keep up with that. And so just in, by way of recap, week chapter, week one, we were in uh, chapter 15 of John. This is the abiding chapter. This is where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. My father is the gardener, he prunes fruitful branches, your job is to produce fruit as you remain in me and as I remain in you. And then, and then week two, we talked about how we are being transformed to love, that God is taking us and he's making us into something altogether different than what we were, that, that this is the essence as we abide. And I gave you this little illustration here. I just said, hey, if this is you, right, God finds you and he finds you with sin in you and he finds you in sin. And so you're stuck in the world, you're in sin, sin is in you, but as God begins to make you something new, the first thing that he does, Dale tells us last week, he puts Christ in you. Now you have the spirit of Christ in you. You have a, a new compass to go by, and that would be enough because that makes you a new creation already with Christ in you, but he says, wait, not just that, I'm actually going to take you with Christ in you, and I'm gonna put you together in Christ, so you've got Christ in you, and, and you are in Christ. No longer, it's not the sin in you, it's not that you're in sin, you've got Christ, the Spirit of God in you, and you're in Christ, and that would be enough, we would be an altogether new creation if that was it, but he says, you know what, it says in the scripture, that you with Christ in you, and you in Christ, that you in Christ are together, hidden with Christ in God, and we said, you know what, and he takes that, and he seals that up, for eternity, and that that is the new creation, like the, this is what you are now, that this is the best way that I can show you what it looks like to abide. And then Nate, in week three, talked about sitting at the feet of Jesus with the story of Mary and Martha, and then as I said last week, Dale talked about the spirit, the, the, the work in our lives that the spirit of God does. That, that we now, we have access to God, that God is with us and in us, and he's, he's communicating to us what he wants from us. And these are ideas that you probably, nothing, you're not like, whoa, that's earth shattering, earth shattering. There's a lot of people that know that, but don't live that. And I think that's, you know, candidly, I think that's the biggest challenge that we face this morning, coming into church, which you've probably been in a church before, and you're gonna hear things that you've probably heard before. And then for some of us, we're gonna go back to our normal lives. And I just pray that today would be the day that that happens for no one, that we would just go back to our normal lives. That, that something would happen in the next few minutes that we have that would be a, a shift for the rest of the rest for you. And that, that's a little intimidating, it's a little scary, um, but I pray that it'd be true. I'll just start in verse one, 1 John chapter two. We're gonna look at five things to know if we're abiding. He says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so he says, hey, I write these to you so that you don't sin, but if you do sin, remember that we've got a mediator, a go-between, an advocate to go on our behalf. He says, remember, and so my first point is I want you to apprehend the gospel. Apprehend the gospel. How do you know if you're abiding? For starters, you apprehend the gospel. Let me tell you why I chose that word, apprehend. Talking to Finley this week, our daughter, 15-year-old, and she says, Dad, I don't apprehend what you're saying. To which I said, you mean comprehend. To which she said, no, I mean apprehend. And I said, apprehend means to arrest or take custody of. She said, no, it means to have a deep understanding of. I said, look, I'm not going to argue with a 15-year-old, okay? I'm an adult, went to college a little bit. 
This is what it means. Turns out she was right. So to honor her, I made it a point. <laughs> Apprehend the gospel. To take hold of at such a deep understanding that it is within you, you apprehend the gospel. And if you, and you can know, because it says from the text, here's how you know if you apprehend the gospel. It's two things. It gives you two things plain as day. First, you don't sin. You do everything you can to eradicate sin from your life. You know that it costs someone their life and you renew your mind around that reality that your sin killed someone. And, and most of you today, most of you here have never killed anyone. You're like, I've got lines. I'm not gonna cross that, I man. I've never killed somebody. No, 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 no. Your sin, it, it cost God his life. It cost Jesus his life, and we know that, but at some point in our journey, we've been inoculated to that reality that it no longer has an impact on our emotions and our being and who we are, that someone had to die. And so we avoid sin if we apprehend the gospel. And the second is like it, if you apprehend the gospel, you avoid shame. So as you avoid sin, if you do sin, then you avoid shame. Now listen, when you sin, it may have hurt you. It may have harmed someone around you. It may have hurt them. And you have work to do in the midst of that. That work that you have to do, that's not shame. That is you doing what you need to do to be reconciled with those around you and to take ownership of the damage that your sin caused. But you don't walk around hanging your head because you spiritually damaged your relationship with God because that in the spiritual realm, that sin has been paid for on the cross. You are reconciled to God. You, you are in partnership with God, in relationship with God. And there's nothing that you're going to do that's going to change that. So if you do sin, the, the thing that you're trying to avoid you lift your head up, you, you, you put your chest out, you say, you see that right there? I did that, that was me. You don't hide it, you don't sweep it under the rug. You say, yep, that was me, I was prideful. I acted a fool, I was angry, I gave full vent to my I, I gossip. I, I bought something I didn't need, I, I said something I shouldn't have, I lied, I cheated, I stole, that was me. Other daughter turned 16 and so, um, she's of driving age, she has her driver's license. And so she and I went halvesies on a 2006 Jeep Liberty. She got her car. And when we began to talk about the car, I gave her two instructions, all right, two kind of categories. There were two things that happened when she got that car. The first thing, I said, don't get in a wreck. And then we talked about all the things that she needs to do to avoid the wreck, right? Because as, as you're trying to eradicate sin from your life, it's not just like, okay, pastor, don't sin, got it. No, no, no. You remove the things that trip you up. Get rid of your phone. Get rid of your laptop. Change jobs. Move if you need to. Change your number. Get a new cell phone, right? Whatever. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Sin is a big deal. Doing whatever you need to do to make sure that you don't sin again, not a big deal. Don't go to the mall. Don't go to that place. Don't go to that community. Don't go to the bar. Don't, don't. Like whatever you need, not a big deal. So she gets a car. She can drive. And I say, hey, listen, these are the things that you need to do to make sure that you don't get in a wreck. Stay off your phone. Don't change the radio station while you're driving. Absolutely under no circumstance. Text and drive 10 and 2, continue to pay attention, right? Don't wreck, don't wreck, don't wreck. And the second thing we did is we got insurance. You know? Just in case. Right? And so a couple weeks ago, I get the call nobody wants to get. Dad, I just got in a wreck. What? Everybody okay? Is everybody, are you okay? Are they okay? Everybody, everybody's okay, Dad. Everybody's okay. Car's not okay. Everybody's okay. Okay. All right, so you sure everything's okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but, but dad, the car is not okay. Well, that's all right. We got insurance. That, they're gonna take care of it. She was, she was like, it's not my fault, which you're always a little bit skeptical of. A 16-year-old tells you that. <laughs> Turns out she was right. It wasn't her fault. It wasn't her fault. Cars totaled, but that's okay. Insurance, all right? And so as you sit there, you, you need to know two realities. Sin is a big deal. It costs someone his life, and I need to do everything I can to avoid it. And you need to do, you need to plan not to sin. 
And if you do sin, you don't need to hide it. You don't need to make light of it. You say, look at that. I did that. You confess it. You receive prayer and you move on. You avoid shame. And that's what it means to apprehend the gospel. Verse 3, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, Jesus, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Claims to, know, it claims to live in him, that in him is meno. It's the word for abide. It's where the series came from. It's the same Greek word that you see in John 15. In fact, here's the way the ESV says it. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And so my second point is as we abide, we behave like Jesus. We behave like Jesus. This is what it looks like to abide that bracelet from the 90s, WWJD, we do what Jesus would do. And, and so many people, and I've heard this my whole Christian life, it's like, what does it mean to abide? Well, you read the Bible. That's what it means to abide. You read the Bible. You spend time in God's word. You pray. Those are the spiritual disciplines. Discipline yourself for godliness. If you are abiding, you certainly do those things, but doing those things in and of themselves are not abiding. Someone who is not abiding can do that. Someone here could know lots of scripture and spent lots of time in God's word and never in their entire life abided in Jesus, ever. It is possible. And so there, there, there are different things with a lot of overlap. The way that I would explain it as he says, I am the vine and you are the branches and the father is the gardener. And if you remain in me and I remain in you, you will produce fruit. Is um, two weeks ago, Monica and I were in Napa for a wedding. I got to do a wedding there. Um, both the bride and the groom work at vineyards. I mean, we have John 15 all around us. There are vines and branches and fruit all around us. It's just coming alive, that chapter. And, and what else is there is what they call a trellis. Uh, it's a cable or a wooden structure. It kind of looks like a fence at times. And this supports the, the vine and allows it to grow. I think we've got a picture of a trellis. So this is it. The, the wood there is supporting the vine and, and the fruit and the growth and whatnot. That's what the disciplines do. That's what reading the Bible does. That's what, that's what praying does. That's what your spiritual disciplines do is they support the branch so that the fruit can grow on it. And those things support the idea of abiding, but they in and of themselves are, are not abiding. Right? They're the activity of abiding, or they can be, I should say. Right? But true abiding is you following Jesus. Now, to follow Jesus, you need to know his word. His voice needs to be familiar to you, but that is abiding, you following Jesus. And here's what it's saying. I want you to know Jesus. As you follow Jesus, you've, he's never, ever, not one time in your entire life has Jesus led you to sin. So if you find yourself in, in sin, you didn't follow him there. Right? If you're looking at something on the internet, you shouldn't. You're clicking a hashtag. You should, you're buying something. You, you don't need. You're saying something. Jesus never going to be like, hey, come over here to these people and let's talk about someone who's not here. Gossip. Let's gossip about them. No, no. Jesus never did that. He never, like he's never led you into sin. And so you're like, oh, but I'm a Jesus follower. No. How are you a Jesus? You're not following Jesus. You didn't follow Jesus right there. Like, how can we be like, oh man, did you see her? And I can't believe she, and oh yeah, I heard that. It's crazy. I'm a Jesus follower. What? Like, when did we just stop, start turning the other way and be like, oh yeah, yeah, sure. They're a Jesus follower. Because they, they were at Harris Creek on Sunday. So they must be. That, that is crazy. Are you telling me I'm not a believer? I'm telling you, you didn't follow Jesus into sin. Right? And, and so there's, there's all kinds of things that could be happening there, but I don't want to normalize that in the church, that it's like, okay, I can be a Jesus follower and never follow him. No, 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 this does not make you a Jesus follower. When you go through those doors as you follow Jesus, that makes you a Jesus follower. You following Jesus, you, you trusting in him, point one, apprehending the gospel and then behaving like Jesus, doing the things that Jesus 
did, right? This is what we are to do. And so if you're falling into sin, you're not following him. Galatians 5 says it like this. So I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Did you just see what the Bible says? You are not to do whatever you want. That means you have wants and desires that you are not to do. You are to do whatever Jesus wants. That's abiding. That you, are in, you remain in him and he remains in you and you do anything and everything he asks you to do. That you behave from Jesus, not for Jesus. No, you have Jesus. So you behave from Jesus. He says in verse seven, dear friends, I am not writing you a new command. This is not new, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command. It's truth, underline truth. It's truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Confusing. Because he's like, this is not new, but it is new. He's saying, I want you to live out a new truth. I'm sorry, I want you to live out an old truth with a new heart. This truth that you're to follow God's law, that you're to love people, that you're, gonna, that you're to do the things that God wants you to do, that's always been there. But now I'm going to give you a new way to follow it, a new heart. And he's he just, it, it, you know, Ezekiel 36 says it like this. The prophet says it like this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You live an old truth with a new heart. And the way I will always illustrate this because it's helpful to me is the Old Testament law, you had directions. Follow these directions. Turn here, go here, look here, there's a stop sign, go three miles, directions. New heart, we have GPS. Now we have a relationship with God. Uh, God is, we're, he's leading us to the same destination. We're getting to the same places, we're taking the same turns, but now it's the voice within us convicting us of sin, illuminating the scriptures that we are to follow, like we have God within us goes on to say verse 9 anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness they do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them so you have these two ideas here you've got light and darkness and then you've got love and hate. And then somewhere in there, you have this idea of truth. That there's a truth that we're to display. And so my, my third point is that we're to illuminate truth with love. If we are abiding, we illuminate truth with love. The truth has always been here on the earth. God raises up his followers to show the world that truth, to illuminate that truth, to light the path. If you are abiding, there is absolutely no room, none whatsoever, no margin for you hating a follower of Jesus. You cannot, you are not allowed to, and in fact you won't, if you are abiding, despise a believer will not happen, right? And so in this world, truth, for, for followers of Jesus, truth and love go hand in hand. They, they are lockstep. And so you have people who are really good at love but miserable at the truth, and it's a counterfeit fruit. It's not a real fruit. It, it's, it's a selfish, well, I feel better about myself and I wanna do this and I don't wanna do hard things but I wanna save the world. It's not real. It, it's not from the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, and then you have people that are, I'm a prophet, heart charging, finger in your chest. Let me tell you what to do. I'll tell you that you want to know the truth. Here's the truth. And there's no love. And it's not real. It's not of God. Depart from me. I never knew you. It's, it's, it's ego driven. It's like, I'm not afraid of anybody. I'll tell you the truth. Heart charging, the way I am, family of origin. Void of love, not of God. What is of God is when truth and love go hand in hand and they display the gospel to the world. Have you, you, you know this person, everybody knows this person, the person who is surrendered to the Holy Spirit, they, they walk with God and, and they love so well. They walk in a room and it's just brighter. Like you would describe their personality as bright. I made, I made a mistake just seeing my wife right there because she's that, right? She's that. I mean, it's crazy. Like, better than anyone I know and to just get to have the opportunity to live with her. But she, and if you know her, you know. I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I can say this with a clear conscience and integrity because you're like, yeah, she is that. And, and, um, and so this isn't like preacher speak. I'm not like, yeah, smoking hot wife, Ricky Bobby, Talladega Night. No, I mean, she, she really is. She really is amazing at loving people, at like just finding someone and making them feel so loved. She also prays more than any human being I've ever met, you know, and it's, all those things go hand in hand, right? They, they go hand in hand. When you understand who God is through the Spirit, like you love people so well, and it's not a personality. It's not like, oh, that's sweet for them. It is foundational to being a follower of Jesus is that people, when they're around you, are like, I felt so loved when I got time with them. And if they don't do that, you need to go back to the Jesus thing and say, am I sure? Like, did I really get that? Right? Have I renewed my mind around that reality? Because it's a dark world. And in your neighborhoods and in your schools and classrooms and in your coffee shops and where you work, there's some really dark things happening. And God, his Holy Spirit in you has given you everything you need to illuminate the truth of the gospel to them. You got to know that. You're on mission there and you've got to live out your mission there. Can we, I, I'm a visual person. I like to feel, can we feel that darkness? Just sit tight for a second. I just want you to feel the darkness of the world in there. Can you guys bring down the lights in here? Yeah, just, yeah. So just, it's dark. It's a dark world. And God has transformed you. He's made you new and he's illuminated you so that you, so that others can see Christ in you. Can we see that? And so when people look at you now, what they see is a lot of God, a lot of Jesus. They see you behaving like Jesus, doing the things that Jesus did. They see that you belong to God, that you have God, that you have God's spirit in you. And so they're looking at you, but they see God. Like this is his plan. This is his strategy. This is the way that he's worked. He's, you're in a dark world full of brokenness, but he's illuminated something in you, truth and love. Let's bring the lights back up. Verse 12. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I'm writing, I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. We could do an entire series on this section of scripture right here. But I'm going to, because we're moving fast, I'm going to summarize this as spiritual growth. You see children, fathers, young men, children, fathers, young men, don't pay too much attention to the, the sex orientation there, the, the gender, if you will. He's talking about spiritual growth. He says, sin's forgiven, know God, overcome evil, know the Father, know God, you are strong. The word of God lives in you, you have overcome evil evil. He, he's saying that if you are abiding, you are growing. There's a spiritual growth that happens there. And so the way that I would say it in the point, you develop spiritually. You develop 
spiritually. You're you're becoming something. You're planted in a healthy soil connected to the vine, and there's growth. And so this is easy for you to measure, right? Like, do you love more today than you did 10 years ago? Do you love God more today than you did 10 years ago? Do you love others more than you did 10 years ago? Do do you know God more than you did 10 years ago? Is there a spiritual growth that everybody around you be like, totally affirm that, man. You you all together different. Like you sprouted. There's, there's There's a growth that's happening there. That comes from abiding. You can't abide and not grow, not develop spiritually. We're trying to help you with this. Did equipping nights this past week. We're going to continue to do those. If you're like, I really want to know God. I really want to grow in these ways. I want to, I want to make disciples in the home. I want, I want a more Christ-centered marriage. Come up for those equipping nights. Sign up for them. Over, over 100 of you did so this week, and you grew. You're like, wow, what am I supposed to do? Take seminary? No, just come to church. We'll help you. We'll help you. I did a celebration of life yesterday, a, um, a memorial service. Uh, you might call it a funeral. Um, baby girl was born to a couple we know and love. She lived 100 minutes and woke up in glory. Um, I've got no issue with that, by the way. Like, if you ever want to, do, you're struggling with, hey, do babies go to heaven? Let's talk, because I, I have a strong conviction there. Woke up in glory. And... Um, I can't imagine. Don't even want to. Uh, the pain that was represented in the room as we we're talking about this sweet little girl and the death that should not be in a broken world, Genesis 3. But I will tell you that you don't want to figure out who Jesus is in the midst of that. And I don't, you know, you, you can be in high school, junior high, you can be married 50 years. I don't know where you're at, but I will tell you, curveballs are coming. There are things coming your way that are going to catch you off guard. Curveballs, you never really anticipate them coming. You know, they're just like, whoa, didn't see that coming. And that was big, and it took a chunk of me. Like a part of me just died in this broken world. Like that was heavy, okay? And it's coming for all of us. And in that moment, what we don't want to do is like, okay, in this moment, just got hit with the curveball. What do I believe about God? I should figure that out right now. Because Satan and the the demonic realm, they're waiting for that moment. And you get there, that curveball hits you, and they're like, all right, let's go, boys. They, They come around, hey, man, see, your God's not good. He's not real. He doesn't love you. See, he wouldn't love you. What if he loved you? This, this would have never happened. And all the theology, it gets all swirly and weird. And you're like, wow, maybe they're right. And you want to make sure that in a moment where there's not curveballs, in a moment where, you know, you're sitting in church and you got here and you had gas in the car to get here and the central air and heat and you're in a cushy chair, you say, all right, what do I believe about God and how do I grow from that so that when my marriage falls apart or my child doesn't come home or these things happen that I never thought would happen to me, you say, I I know who Jesus is and I'm going to hold fast to those truths right now. I've been growing in those truths. I've been growing in those truths. I've developed spiritually. Verse 15. Do not, he says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The fifth and final point is I want you to eternally live. Eternally live. Eternally live is different than living eternally because when you apprehended the gospel, you've trusted in Jesus' death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins, meaning you don't have to pay for your sins in hell. You get to be with God forever in his kingdom. You are going to eternally, you're going to live eternally. 
But what I'm talking about when I say eternally live is I'm talking about living today for eternity. That every single decision that you make today impacts your eternity and that you and I have the opportunity to take things in this world and store them in eternity. That we're gonna be with God forever and ever and ever and we could put stuff there for us to enjoy then. And we actually, like I'm not crazy, I'm not intoxicated, I'm not under influence of anything other than the Holy Spirit saying we actually sincerely, deeply, at a conviction level, apprehend that we believe that. And the, and the reality of that impacts how we talk, how we live, how we buy, who we serve, how we love, uh, uh, you know, the fights that we choose to get in or avoid, and all the things we do. When uh, we were considering the move to Waco, I feel like I talk about this all the time. I'm sorry, this, is just, this hit me as I was thinking about this passage. We didn't plan on that. We had just built a home. I, I really thought we were going to die in naively. I was like, if we, this is the house we'll always have. Our grandkids will, you know. And um, we loved our schools and our neighborhood and our, all the things. And so we began to write the list of why to stay and why to go. And, and here on the list of why to stay, it was like, well, we have roots here. And we're processing this with, with uh, the treadaways. We're also considering moving and our life groups who's there and, and, and people that we've invited to speak in this decision. And, and, and there's the, the list of reasons to stay. And right there is like, we've got roots here. And somebody goes, well, that's not good. And I go, what do you mean that's not good? And they go, well, this isn't your home. You don't put down roots in the world. You know, and, and you don't, it's like, that's not, we're not trying to show our kids like, hey, we've got roots here, like this is where we go and God's not gonna call us anywhere else. It's like, we're agile, we're nomads. We're like, God, where do you want me to go and where do you want me to be on mission? And sometimes that's Starbucks, but sometimes it's two hours away and sometimes it's 2,000 miles away. I don't know. But I know that is the life of the one who abides. God, what would you have me do? And in that moment, they say roots are not good. And all of the sudden, the, the list of the reasons to stay became reasons to go. Because I could summarize all of those things in one word, comfort. But it's comfortable. I say, oh, but we're not called to comfort. We're called to be on mission. And little did we know the blessings that God would have for us here. We just didn't. I mean, it's been amazing. It's just when you, you know, it's, it's incredible. Maybe you've done this. I don't, I don't know if, if you've moved or been called to another place or something, but, but maybe you've gone through this experience. When you're moving just homes or apartments, you, you got two boxes, like boxes to keep, boxes to give away. Have you ever done this? clean out your closets, like here, you know, this is like Goodwill, and oh, that's, oh, you know, who, oh, so-and-so, is the, he wears that same size, let's call him, see if he wants that, or uh, I think, yeah, I think he, he's he complimenting him on that hat, let's give that to him, and, and I want to keep, oh yeah, I want to keep that, I want to yeah, keep, definitely want to keep that, keep, 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 we'll give that away, keep that, that never wore that, right, and we're just like, keep, give away, keep, give away, in the kingdom, those boxes get switched, Right, Everything that you gave away in the name of Jesus comes back to you and you keep forever. And all of the things that you kept in the world because they were comfortable, you lose forever. You don't have them forever and ever and ever. The boxes get switched this way. So do not love the world or things in the world. You gotta love the poignancy, the, the clarity that the Holy Spirit speaks with because there's no room for confusion. There's no crazy Greek stuff happening there. Do not love the world or things in the world. And if I'm you, I'm thinking, yeah, but what? how many pair of Jordans do you have? Didn't you just build a house? So I, I don't want to play, I don't want to say stuff up here and be like, oh yeah, just turn your other head and let's go do it, you know? No, no, we got to do it. So let's talk about it. To buy a $100 pair of shoes means that children today who need food and water will die. Like, you could save their lives, literally. That's the truth. It's the absolute truth. And you can say, okay, do I want to give this there and save their lives? 
Do I want a new pair of shoes? And you have to wrestle with that. Let me say that again. You and I and we have to, must, don't have an option not to wrestle with that. That's the application. You're going to build a house. How big a house do you need? How are you going to use the house? What's not going to happen because of the house you built? You must wrestle with that. We do not have the luxury to not wrestle. We don't have the luxury to not get in the room and say, hey, I want you guys to speak into this. Let's whiteboard it. Let's talk. Let me give you full transparency of the cost. Help me make these decisions. Hey, you should ask those questions. Where did those shoes come from? I, I'm, I, let's talk about it. Because there's nothing in my life that's private from you. I mean, honestly, they're, they're really this crazy statement. But I'm happy to have any of those conversations. And you should be ready for them too in your own life. Because we don't have the luxury to not wrestle with them. Because the scripture is saying, do not love the world or things in the world. And you can't look at that verse and say, oh, yeah, okay. And then go out there and love the world and things in the world. You can't do it. It's not abiding. It's not abiding. And so in summary, we apprehend the gospel. We behave like Jesus. We illuminate the truth. We develop spiritually. We eternally live. Apprehend. Behave. Illuminate demonstrate, eternally live. You abide. That's what it means to abide. Apprehend, behave, illuminate, develop spiritually, eternally live. This is how you know you're abiding. Who do you measure yourself against? you go back to long jump with me for just a minute when they um, took us to public school I only placed one time that I remember I think that's true I'll I'll say this I only got first one time (laughs) because I showed up and they said everyone that is competing in this event is disqualified because they've prioritized other events. And so all you need to do is not scratch. And you won. And so I remember I went up, you have to jump three times. So I went up to the board, you know, made sure I didn't scratch. I jumped, I got first place. Ribbon yours. You got two more jumps. You got two more jumps. So I backed up. I did what I always do. I ran. I did what I trained to do. We'd gone to practice. We practiced trying to jump further and further and further. We did exercises to make sure we could jump further. We strengthened our legs. We practiced timing, marking off our spots, all the things. We had practiced and trained, and there I am. And so I ran as fast as I could, and I hit that board, and I jumped as far as I could. And it was so different. It's hard to go back and be in the mind of an eighth grader, but I can just tell you that to, to this day at 43, I remember there was something different It's like, who am I competing against? Who am I competing against? Me. Me, the ribbon's mine. I already won, like, let's have fun. Let's do what I was made to do, you know? It's like, man, I got this, let's go. Back it up, let's do it again. Let's do it again, and this is so difficult, right? That shift that's abiding. So what's crazy, the good news is you came in here this morning and, and you think like, you can, you, know, it's, you can actually grade yourself. I don't know if you, you, you picked up on that, but you can take each of those five things. You can give them a, a 20 point 
numeric system, you know, you grade each of them, each of them's worth 20 points, and you can say, all right, how am I doing one to 20 at apprehending the gospel? How am I doing one to 20 at behaving like Jesus? How am I doing, when, and then you can add it all up, and it's gonna give you a grade on a 100-point scale, you know, and you, you'll get a grade, you'll know how you're doing. Understand where you're at. But all that needs to happen for you to move from where you're at right now to fully and completely abiding is an understanding that Jesus, he won the prize on my behalf. I got an A, I got the blue ribbon, I got the spot reserved for me in eternity. And now I have his spirit and he's called me to do all of these things out of this world, to live different than the world does, to parent different than the world does, to go to school different than the world does, to compete different than the world does, to take a test different than the world does. To, to have in your alone time different than the world does, right? To work different than the world does. To spend different than the world. To talk different than the world does. It's all his. It's all his. It's all his. It's all interwoven. It's his. It's all together. You belong to him. He belongs to you. You remain in him. He remains in you. And you leave all together different. And that truth, that reality is available to you right now. You just say, do I believe it? So let me pray. Do we believe it? We'll pray right now. We'll ask God. You ask God right now. Ask him. Just, hey, God, do I believe that? Do I believe that you resurrect dead marriages? Do I believe that you bring prodigals home? Do I believe that you can take someone who, like a dog to his vomit, returns to sin every day, every week, and you can stop it. You can change it. The, the person furthest from you in my life, you can save right now effortlessly. Do I believe that? And it all starts with, do I apprehend? The gospel, do I really understand? I've, I've been told that you died for my sins. Has that impacted me recently at an emotional level the way that it would if, if, if on the way home today I, I, I was texting someone and I, and, I, and I looked at my phone and I actually mowed through somebody. I, I killed somebody. And I think, gosh, what I did wrong just cost someone their life. Has the gospel impacted me like that at that level? Have I understood it at that level that my sin you had to die for? Ask him. Ask him if you have. And ask him for help. She remain in him. And he remains in you.